Okay, so there was some actual interesting news in regards to OpenAI, and one of the things that I found out was that some OpenAI researchers, including an ally of Sutskiva, were fired for alleged leaking. This is pretty, pretty crazy news. We can see here that OpenAI has fired two researchers for allegedly leaking information, according to a person with knowledge of the situation. They include Leopold Aschenbrenner, a researcher on the team dedicated to keeping artificial intelligence safe for society. Aschenbrenner was also an ally of OpenAI chief scientist Ilya Sutskova, who participated in a failed effort to force out CEO Sam Altman last fall. It's not clear what information the two staffers leaked. The other staffer, Pavel Ismailov, a researcher who worked on reasoning, had also spent time on the safety team, and the ouster of the two men is among the first staffing changes that have surfaced since publicly Sam Altman resumed his board seat in March. And it's pretty, pretty crazy because uh, these two were on some of the, you know, super alignment research papers that were really, really important. And it, you know, says that here, it says internally, Ashenbrenner was one of the faces of what OpenAI calls its super alignment team. And that was the team in which they were trying, well, not were, they are, you know, pretty much trying to solve super alignment with, you know, artificial, superly intelligent systems, if that makes any sense, but ASI. So they're trying to align, you know, those really powerful systems. Um, and they were doing that with Sutskova. So it's pretty interesting that, um, you know, many people were stating that why did they even mention that these guys were allies of Sutskova? I think it's kind of interesting because, you know, Sutskova's role at the company is unknown. There have been, you know, numerous rumors circulating around wondering where he is, what he's doing. And then, of course, two people who are quote unquote allies with Sutskova who were also working on super alignment and now fired. So I don't know. It's kind of interesting to just, you know, see what's going on at OpenAI. Um, and you can see that it says Sutskova, co-founder responsible for OpenAI's biggest breakthrough, was part of the board that fired Sam Altman. And um, yeah, he's been largely absent from OpenAI since the Amshinbrenner, when reached by phone, did not have an immediate comment and Ismailov did not have a request to comment. So um, yeah, it's pretty crazy. And the lawyer who has represented Suskova did not represent, uh, you know, for, for a comment. So, I mean, the situation here is pretty interesting. A lot of people are now speculating, wondering whether that means OpenAI is going to get any more leaks. But I don't know what kind of leaks they were doing. Some people have speculated that they were leaking to, you know, foreign intelligence or foreign nations or whatever. That's just pure speculation. Some people are saying that, you know, it's links to Jimmy Apples and, you know, the Twitter leaks. But I mean, I got to be honest, I, th I think whatever leak this is, I do think it has to be really serious for them to get fired over it because the Jimmy Apples leaks are like not substantial information. It's not like it's an entire document that he posts on Twitter, you know, stating what the new models are going to have. It's usually a vague tweet from account that has like three followers. And then long after the, you know, information has been published, um, he retweets it and says, look, I knew this information is before. And of course, he does have inside information, but it's just not usually leaked in the way that it uh, as like, you know, would seem to lead to a firing. Maybe opening eyes really, really strict. But um, I'm guessing that it had to be probably serious for them to fire two members of their really important team. I know that, yes, um, you know, as well, another thing that I do know is that, you know, AI talent right now is really, really hard to come by in the sense that all these labs are fighting over, you know, people like these two, these individuals. But I wonder how that actually impacts their market value in terms of finding another career. I don't think it's going to be too bad considering how competitive the AI space is in terms of trying to find AI researchers that can, you know, work on um, reasoning and stuff like that and especially trying to get to AGI. I'm just thinking that, you know, it, it, potentially it may have been, you know, more serious than we think considering that they just decided to fire them. Either way, um, it's pure speculation. I don't think we're ever going to know because if it is serious, it's probably going to be lawyers involved, probably going to be uh, stuff that's not disclosed to us. So, um, yeah, it will be interesting to see if there is any more information on that. But there was some other interesting news. There was also this, a voice agent indistinguishable from humans handling interruptions smoothly and responding to the, you know, um, person. So take a look at this because this was pretty fascinating. Hi there. This is Mia from Ace Plumbing. How can I help you tonight? Hey, Mia. Yeah, I have an emergency here. We've got water leaking from our upstairs bathroom. It must be a burst pipe. Oh, no, that sounds stressful. I can definitely help with that. We do have an extra service charge for off-hour emergency services of $150. 
Is the pipe still leaking? Yeah, that charge is fine, and yeah, it's still leaking. Okay, got it. Do you know how to shut off the water main to your house? If not, yeah, I can Yeah, yeah, I know, I know how to do that. Don't worry about that. I will do that right after this call. Great. Do you still want a plumber to come tonight? If so, may I have your name and address, please? Yes, we do. It's Kara Smith at 146 uh, Stevens Road in Alamo. Okay, let me check the schedule. Um, yes, we can have someone at your house at 11 p.m., Thank you for providing that information. Sounds good. Thanks so much. You're welcome, Kara. Is there anything else I can help with? If not, thank you for calling. If anything else comes up, feel free to give us a call back. Goodbye. Okay, so I want to ask you guys this. What do you think about this kind of software? Do you think that this is good for reducing overhead in terms of companies? Or do you think this is just mindless automation that leads to, you know, people not doing the work? I do think that this kind of work isn't exactly particularly fulfilling, so I don't think it's as bad. But I'm, you know, intrigued to know your opinions because I'm someone that when I call up a support place and then I have to talk to an AI system, it's frustrating, okay? But I think our frustration comes from the fact that we don't understand these AI systems. So in the future, if these AI systems are actually, you know, infinitely smarter and they actually do work as well as a human, will there be as big of a, you know, disagreement with these systems in place? Because that's what I want to ask you guys. Um, and I don't think there will be considering the fact that some people just want their issue resolved. Um, and of course, some people like myself, I, I think by that time, we might be considered old fashioned. And I'm guessing that, you know, the newer generation, the generation growing up will probably be just knowing that they've always spoken to AI systems and not potentially people. So maybe it's just going to be a generational thing that changes as the new generations come in. Then we have introducing Udio. And this was by far one of the biggest announcements that I will cover in a more detailed video because there's actually a lot that people are missing but take a look at um this demo video and then i'm going to show you guys something that i found to be just absolutely hilarious from this Udio.com. Maybe you skipped the demo and all the music of listening to it, but um, I think it's important to actually look at the prompts. And there was, uh, this is probably the funniest part of the video. Um, and I just think this is honestly so funny, okay? And apologies to Seth in advance. But I found this tweet, okay? And this is basically on the platform. And someone found an account on the Udio platform that essentially is generating songs about how his friend Seth managed to, uh, you know. Why'd you have to go? I guess you could say release his bowels unexpectedly at work. And honestly, the fact that it sounds so professional is just, it's just hilarious. Okay, this is the, this is the funniest thing I've seen all day. I honestly can, cannot stop laughing at this, but I'm guessing that some people are just continually to make songs about their friend um, who managed to release their bowels at work. And the songs are actually just hilarious. Take a listen. Seth shits his pants at Gladstone's. He was a grown man. Who pooped in his pants And Dave had to drive him home <laughs> Oh man, okay. that, that just never gets old I got me a man, but, but there's just one problem Well, he works nine to five and he's a hell of a guy But 
he shit in his pants at work. Oh, Seth. What? I'm sorry, but like, that's just the funniest thing I've ever seen. Um, and I think, I think the use cases for this are going to be pretty hilarious. I mean, there's so many custom soundtracks and creative ways that people are going to use this. Um, ho ho hopefully Seth doesn't mind that. Um, but uh, it's pretty funny. Okay. It's pretty, pretty funny. Okay. But um, the point is, is that the, the quality is absolutely incredible. And if you're using Udio, uh, it's actually been created by former researchers at Google. Uh, they made a previous um, paper called Lyra. And oh, no, it was either Lyra or Lyria, to, apologies. But um, the point is, is that Google researchers, I think, are increasingly leaving Google to create products. And I'm wondering if Google is even going to be standing in the future, because recently Demis Asab has talked about starting up his own AI lab. And that's the current Google AI CEO. And the reason is, um, Google just isn't putting out the products. Google has literally, I've looked through so many Google research papers. When I tell you they have a boatload of stuff that is, I wouldn't say it's ready to release, but they could really, really crush the AI game if they wanted to. But for some reason, I don't know what's going on with the governance structure, how things are organized there, but for some reason they are taking forever to release products and it's frustrating people, which is why people leave and they create, you know, software like this that people can use to make stuff like this. So it will be interesting to see if Google blows its lead because honestly, the way things are shaping up, I, th I think they're gonna. Now we have a, a clip from uh, Ray Kurzweil, a legendary futurist, talking about how even his, you know, technological progress timelines, uh, it's moving faster than his predictions. If you have been at the center of this, um, extraordinary uh, last few years. Can I ask you, is it moving faster than you expected it to? How does it, f how does it feel to you? It, it feels like a few years. I mean, I made a prediction in 1999. It feels like we're two or three years ahead of that. So it's still pretty close. Jeffrey, how about you? Yeah, my I think for everybody except Ray, it's moving faster than we expected. <laughs> <laughs> There was also a research paper from Google that was infinite uh, context windows, which is uh, it's pretty insane. I'm not going to you know spend too much time talking about it. But the point is, is that uh, if this application is true, then that means we could get infinite context windows, which could mean absolutely insane ramifications for the future. And the reason this is so crazy is that I remember when I was talking, I think, eight months ago about how 100k context lengths are just absolutely incredible and now it went from 100k to 128k to 500k to a million and now to infinite like it like trying to wrap your head around how fast ai is moving is uh pretty pretty surprising um so i mean you know it, it like right now i can't even speak properly can't even make a sentence coherently to uh, present this video but the point is is uh you know it's it's just incredible how crazy this is moving and uh, people like me are even shocked, to so to speak. In the amount of compute used to train the cutting edge AI models per year. So instead of doubling per year, which is the Moore's law trend, we're increasing the amount of compute by 10 times per year, because in this case, we don't need the compute to be smaller. We can just daisy chain more computers together. So our server farm at Inflection, for example, is the size of four football pitches, right? It's wow. absolutely astronomical uses like 50 megawatt of power um and you know so wow. you look at it it's like absolutely mind-blowing it roars like like an engine and all of that is is really just graphics cards you know just like you have in your in your you know if you have a desktop gaming machine you might have a gpu graphics card we just daisy chain tens of thousands of these up together so that they can do parallel processing um on you know trillions of words from the open web this 10x increase in the amount of compute used to train so yeah it's pretty incredible that how much compute is going up in terms of what they're using to train cutting edge ai um and him saying that it's you know a four football fields is absolutely insane and we know that open ai are building you know stargate which is going to be an insane level of compute in the future so i mean uh it's just going to be fascinating to see how Moore's law continues to progress in terms of, you know, AI development, because it's going to make things a lot faster, a lot more efficient, and of course, a lot more crazy in terms of the capabilities that we're going to see in systems, because we're going to be able to train models faster and deploy them faster. Definitely intuition involved there. There was Monte Carlo rollout too, but it's, it's playing with intuition about what moves to consider and how good the position is for us. It's had neural nets for that, that capture intuition. And so... I see no reason to think it might not be creative. In fact, for the large language models, as Ray pointed out, they know much more than we do, and you can, th and they know it in far fewer connections. We have about a hundred trillion synapses; they have about a trillion connections. So what they're doing is they're compressing a huge amount of information into not that many connections, 
And that means they're very good at seeing the similarities between different things. They have to see the similarities between all sorts of different things to compress the information into their connections. That means they've seen all sorts of analogies that people haven't seen because they know about all sorts of things that no one person knows about. And that's, I think, the source of creativity. So yeah, that was a fascinating, fascinating piece of insight from Jeffrey Hinton. The Jeffrey Hinton. And he talks about, you know, the previous creative advances that we've seen in systems like AlphaGo. And I think in the future, we're probably going to get to a really creative system because, you know, creativity does come from what you know and trying to think in creative and abstract ways. And then we're going to be able to get systems which, you know, of course, know more than any human on the planet. And combining that with certain technologies, I mean, we're probably going to get really, really creative systems, especially with hallucinations and all these kind of different things. I mean, it's just an interesting, interesting future to be a part of. Um, Everyone is bullish, LLM. And concretely, we believe that when we look at very complex scenes of Sora Fujit, right? Like that snowy scene in Tokyo that we saw in the very beginning, that Sora is already beginning to show a detailed understanding of how humans interact with one another, how they have physical contact with one another. And as we continue to scale this paradigm, we think eventually it's going to have to model how humans think. The only way you can generate truly realistic video with truly realistic sequences of actions is if you have an internal model of how all objects, humans, etc., environments work. And so we think this is how Sora is going to contribute to AGI. So I'm going to spend a bit of time talking about that. One last <laughs> <the> question. <laughs> Thanks for a great talk. So my question is on the training data. So how much training data do you estimate that it's required for us to get to AGI? And do you think we have enough data on the internet? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. I think we have enough data to get to AGI. Um, and I also think people always come up with creative ways to improve things. And when we hit limitations, we find creative ways to improve results regardless. So I think that whatever data we have will be enough to get to AGI. Wonderful. Okay, let's do AGI. Thanks. Most people, including most scientists, have a particular view of what the mind is that I think is utterly wrong. So they have this inner theatre notion. The idea is that what we really see is this inner theatre called our mind. And so, for example, if I tell you I have the subjective experience of little pink elephants floating in front of me, most people interpret that as there's some inner theater, and in this inner theater that only I can see, there's little pink elephants. And if you ask what they're made of, philosophers will tell you they're made of qualia. Um, and I think that whole view is complete nonsense. And we're not going to be able to understand whether these things are sentient until we get over this ridiculous view of what the mind is. So let me give you an alternative view. And and once I've given you this alternative view, I'm going to try and convince you that chatbots are already sentient. But I don't want to use the word sentience. I want to talk about subjective experience. It's just a bit less controversial because it doesn't have the kind of self-reflexive aspect of consciousness. So if we analyze what it means when I say, I see little pink elephants floating in front of me, what's really going on is I'm trying to tell you what my perceptual system is telling me when my perceptual system's going wrong. And it wouldn't be any use for me to tell you which neurons are firing. But what I can tell you is what would have to be out there in the world for my perceptual system to be working correctly. And so when I say I see little pink elephants floating in front of me, you can translate that into um, if there were little pink elephants out there in the world, my perceptual system would be working properly. And notice the last thing I said didn't contain the phrase subjective experience, but it explains what a subjective experience is. It's a hypothetical state of the world that allows me to convey to you what my perceptual system is telling me. So the last clip of Jeffrey Hinton talking about AI chatbots have sentient and subjective experience because there's no such thing as qualia and AGI House talking about the future of AGI. Let me know what your most interesting thing was this week.